thanks for the opportunity to, to speak today. Uh, going to step back and look at what you should expect from the pathologist in terms of surgical pathology reporting. Uh, what are the essentials you should see in the reports? This is important not only for primary but for metastatic lesions in terms of prognosis. So the essential features are, of course, subtype, grade, presence of tumor necrosis, sarcomatoid rhabdoid differentiation, and stage. I want to go back a little bit historically. When I first tr started training 20 years ago, we were still using the term hypernephroma. So we've come a long way in a relatively short time. The first classifications really took off in the 1996-1997 Heidelberg and Rochester conferences where really the current uh, format for classification was established. I do want to highlight 2012 uh, in Vancouver, uh, there was a consensus conference of urologic pathologists on staging prognostic features grade that appears in this month's American Journal of Surgical Pathology. It was an excellent meeting. Uh, a lot of recommendations for changes were made, including uh, grade. Historically, I have two figures there. One is Professor Grawitz. He's a lower uh, photo, not a very pleasant man, uh, not very social either. He went to one meeting his entire career, and for some reason, a urologic pathologist at our social event, we call it the Grawitz Dinner at our national meeting, and I have no idea why. He actually uh, hypothesized that these tumors were adrenal origin, uh, hence the term hypernephroma, and that lasted for decades. Uh, Dr. Bell is a pathologist at uh, Minnesota. The three centimeter rule, anything that's smaller than three centimeters was benign, greater than three centimeters was malignant. And of course, both, both those individuals are incorrect. So since hypernephroma, our classification system has changed dramatically. Uh, we've added a number of new entities. Some are increasing in frequency as we're recogniz recognizing them more often. Uh, clear cell papillary and chromophobe clearly make up the, the majority of tumors we'll see, but it's important that we recognize these other variants. Here's a clear cell, advanced stage, gross photo with involvement of the renal vein, uh, high-grade lesion. If you look in these tumors enough, you'll see low-grade areas that you see on the right microscopically, a lot of lipid, uh, classic features. Papillary, friable tumors, uh, papillary cores with uh, histious, foamy histiocytes, fairly easy to recognize. We've subclassified these tumors. This is a papillary type 1, papillary type 2, and at the conference we recommended that we report these types grade appears to be more important, but on the left is a type 1, which is basophilic, uh, small cells. On the right is type 2, eosinophilic, uh, more atypia. Uh, I've never seen a metastatic lesion on a pure type 1, whereas the metastatic lesions tend to be type 2. Here's a chromophobe renal cell carcinoma, classic plant cell-like appearance. Uh, again, 95% of these tumors do very well. Those with necrosis or sort of combatoid differentiation, advanced stage, those are the important, important features and should be, of course, reported. Now, why is this important for us to report? Actually, the, there was controversy amongst even pathologists whether it mattered to subtype or not. And it was clear by the consensus conference that the majority, greater than 90 percent, said yes because of the prognostic differ differences between these tumors, uh, even for uh, more local advanced stages. There are some new subtypes that you'll see in surgical pathology reports. One of them is clear cell papillary or clear cell tubular papillary. Not a very good name. It's confusing because you think, is it a mixed tumor? What is it? Well, it is, an, is a distinct entity and different from clear cell and different from papillary. It tends to be low grade, uh, not very aggressive. Most patients are cured. There's a single report of a metastatic lesion. But this probably will be the third most common subtype in renal cell carcinoma as we go, as we go and study this more. Just wanted to present photos of the more, uh, the rare variants uh, and going from the upper left translocation associated across the mucinous tubular spindle cell, tubulocystic, and then renal medullary or collecting duct. And again, it's critical that pathologists understand the spectrum of these lesions and, and give you the appropriate diagnosis. Moving on to stage, or excuse me, grade, uh, some major changes were made at the consensus conference. And the number one was to drop the term Furman, that really it is a nuclear grade on the nuclear size and not a nuclear grade, and thus really should be designated as really the ISUP grade. And that was a re recommendation that was made. I do have a picture of Dr. Skinner, and I give him the credit for develop, really developing the first and, and most comprehensive grading system. As you know, he's a uro uh, urologist, uh, recently retired from USC, but as a resident at Mass General, wrote a very good paper on grading in renal cell carcinoma. 
and really was kind of lost in the, in the literature and not even cited by Furman. And I've had the opportunity to talk with Dr. Skinner, and he made sure to say to mention Dr. Compton, who was the pathologist on this study. Now here's the outcome in our series of the various grades, uh, one and two cluster together. They're significantly different, but, but marginally, and the big drop-off occurs between two and three and, and three and four. Here's other features that we talked about at the consensus conference, and interesting, a lot of these features, are particularly necrosis, 30% of pathologists, urologic pathologists, didn't mention it in their path report, and I think that's, that's a mistake, and the consensus was there also that this needed to re be reported and put in, in the report. Uh, fat invasion, we'll talk a little about, and then the patterns of, of differentiation. Here's tumor necrosis. Really has characteristic features, a coagulum, apop apoptotic debris, and it occurs about 20% of grade three tumors, very rare in grade two. So if you're seeing reports that have grade two and 50% of the tumors have necrosis in them, they're probably looking at other degenerative features that aren't true tumor necrosis. And uh, something to talk, talk about with, with the pathologist. If you look at the outcome in clear cell renal cell carcinoma, the drop-off in outcome is significant given uh, a tumor that has necrosis versus one that, that doesn't. This outcome difference is also important in, in chromophobe renal cell carcinoma, similar drop-off in survival. Important in papillary, but not, not like clear cell and, and chromophobe. I got a phone call from uh, one of the other pathologists from New Zealand, Brad Delahunt, who's done a lot in, in the pathology of renal cell, and said, what happens if you combine necrosis and uh, grade into a single system? So what we did was we took the data and grouped patients on, based on their ISUP grade, and the presence or absence of necrosis, and on sarcomatoid uh, differentiation present or absent. And you created nine groups uh, based on those features. And you can see the proportion of clear cells uh, grade two that had necrosis was only about 2% of patients. Now, if you take those groups and you stratify them with a combination of grade and necrosis, you see a Kaplan-Meier cur curve that stratifies out like this. So grade one and two is uh, one and two tumors without necrosis. Uh, grade th three and four are groups grade, excuse me, groups three and four are renal cell grade uh, two with necrosis and grade three without necrosis. And then six, five, uh, excuse me, five, six, seven, eight, uh, is where necrosis appears. So now you're able to stratify those curves based on a grading system that uh, incorporates necro necrosis. The point, uh, at this point, this system's being validated, has not been uh, put into practice, but uh, it may be but dependent on its validation. Here's a common feature, degeneration in a low-grade renal cell carcinoma, a lot of fibrin. That has been mis misinterpreted as necrosis, and that may drive up uh, the presence of necrosis in reports in low-grade lesions. Moving on to, to uh, fat invasion, uh, historically we've been always focused as pathologists on that peripheral paranephric fat, and for some reason we weren't paying attention to the renal sinus fat, and that's really where all the lymphatics and the venous drainage occurs. And uh, not until recently, work by Houston Thompson at Mayo and Dr. Steve Bonsib at, at uh, Louisiana, University of Louisiana, Louisiana State, really have turned our attention to the renal sinus fat. This is a retrospective study looking at outcomes uh, in patients that had perinephric versus renal sinus. And this is really not going, going back to the, the old cases where they weren't paying attention to renal sinus and may not have sampled it. We still see a difference in outcome. Uh, so it is important. If you go back to T1 patients uh, that died of renal cell carcinoma that really shouldn't, we actually had the opportunity to go back to this gross specimen put more tissue in and look at the renal sinus uh, fat in patients that died of renal cell carcinoma, really should not have. And you see that those patients, we missed sinus fat invasion. It was there in the majority of patients and was overlooked. And I think that occurred at mul you know, most institutions. Again, we're not paying attention uh, to that pathologic feature. In fact, Dr. Bonsip says that two T tumors don't really exist, that if you sample that renal sinus fat in very large renal cells, you'll nearly always find fat invasion. Those patients are always PT3, not PT2. And here's some photomicrographs of the various patterns of renal sinus fat invasion. Now, often that renal cell has a capsule and a close interface with the renal sinus fat, and that is not invasion. It could push into it without invading. Finally, I want to finish up on sarcomatoid renal cell carcinoma. Here's a large sarcomatoid mass, 
actually composed of bone. Here's a chromophobe with a spindle cell component. And essential that we recognize this as pathologist because of its impact on outcome. And you see that grade four without sarcomatoid does significantly worse, uh, or excuse me, with sarcomatoid does significantly worse than grade four without. And if you look at the subtypes, uh, once you've had sarcomatoid differentiation occur, it doesn't matter what the underlying subtype is. It, it has a very aggressive outcome. And I'll actually finish with that. And since I'm in Iowa and Chicago, I'll put American Gothic there. So thank you.